Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, webinar. My name is Maria Lind. This is uh, the second webinar in the series Why Curate Art, which is a course uh, that is a subjective account of uh, why it is interesting, relevant, and even urgent to curate contemporary art. I'm extremely pleased to have Victor Misiano as uh, a respondent tonight. I believe that most of you who are attending are familiar with Victor's important work as a curator, writer, uh, theoretician, and also editor and somebody who I personally have known for more than 20 years and whose practice I have followed with curiosity since then. So the setup is like this. I will do a presentation. And tonight the focus is uh, Tensta Konsthal and my tenure there between 2011 and uh, 2018. It will be about one hour then Victor is going to respond. And after that, we open up for Q&A for those of you who are present. I will now find my PowerPoint and ask Maxime to let me uh, share my screen. So imagine now that you are in Tensta, a suburb of Stockholm, about 20 minutes on the subway from the city center. You enter an art center and uh, next to the reception, there is a small gallery space and you encounter a small sculpture on a podium encased in a plexi box. You come closer and you realize that uh, it is uh, several hard drives interconnected with one another, which um, allow you as a visitor to go online at the art center without being uh, detected, i.e. through the dark net. This is a sculpture by Trevor Pagland, who is based between uh, New York, San Francisco and Berlin. And his autonomy cube is a response to several different things. One, which is uh, how museums and art institutions have been developing over the last few decades, where not only have ticket prices gone up when you buy a ticket to a museum, at least in Western Europe and in North America, you're often also asked about details uh, about where you live, uh, when you were born, and sometimes even more questions. One of many instances in contemporary life where the collective collecting, assembling of facts um, of you as a customer is at play. But uh, here you are as a visitor, if you choose to use uh, this functional sculpture, still uh, anonymous and uh, potentially there is a certain autonomy in this. For Trevor Paglen, when he talks about this sculpture and he has shown it in many different uh, art institutions across uh, the world, it is uh, a wish for a parallel to how libraries are working in the sense that uh, they're often for free uh, access, at least if it's public libraries, uh, is relatively simple. And another reference for the sculpture comes from the history of art, namely minimalist sculpture 
and we can think of uh, Hans Hacke's condensation cubes. Condensation cubes as sculptures where the environment and the people surrounding the sculpture had an impact on the appearance of the sculpture in the sense that the uh, density of the audience could affect the amount of condensation appearing uh, inside the cube. This cube is also sensitive to its environment, but in an entirely different way. If you then would continue into the next space of the art center in Tensta, at the same time in 2017, you would see a big projection of a video essay by Naim Mohaimen. Um, an essay that is partly based on found footage, uh, partly based on found audio. Unique, uh, a unique recording of the conversation between hijackers on a Japan Airlines flight that landed in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, as it was hijacked by members of the Japanese uh, Liberation Army, the Japanese uh, relatives, you could say, of the Red Army fraction uh, in Germany. Between them and the people in the control tower in Dhaka at the airport, specifically the highest military commander in the country at the time, this recording of a very tense exchange between two people where the lives of everybody on board were at stake was something that the artist came across by chance and it became the starting point for the uh, S video essay called It's Not Necessary to Understand Everything. And in the film, we follow the intense events unfolding. Uh, this happens to be the last successful hijacking of uh, several in the 70s in the sense that nobody uh, died and even the kid kidnappers could um, escape with a ransom sum and some of them have not been tracked down to this very day. For Naim Mohaimen, there was also news footage involved. Uh, this was also a personal memory from him watching television as a kid back home in Dhaka and waiting for his favorite program, but it never appeared because state television was broadcasting continuously hour after hour, the plane on the runway where the hijacking was happening. Naim Hyman has looked at what he calls the failures of the left in the 70s and 80s in a number of uh, art projects and um, often connected to the history of uh, Bangladesh, which is where he's from. He's currently based in New York. And at uh, Tensta Konsthal, this project was part of an ongoing series that we called the Eros Effect, Art, Solidarity Movements and the Quest for Social Justice. So over a period of uh, four years, a number of different elements or parts of the project took place one after the other. So instead of making, for example, a group exhibition, on the topic of um, solidarity and uh, uh, art, we decided to stay with the question for a longer period of time and to let it unfold in a variety of different formats, including solo presentations like Naim Mohaimen's, but there were also um, a group exhibition, symposias, uh, commissions, Naim's work wasn't already existing artwork, but we also made uh, new commissions, 
et cetera. Another part of the very same series, which also happened at the same time, was uh, a small archival exhibition in a third space uh, of the art center. It looked at uh, an exhibition in 1978, the International Art Exhibition in Solidarity with Palestine, where the two curators and researchers, Christine Khoury and Rasha Salti, were focusing on a exhibition in Beirut, which consisted of donations from artists from um, the Middle East and North Africa and beyond. The collection that resulted from the donations was supposed to be the seed collection for a national museum for the coming state of Palestine. This particular collection then toured as an exhibition in the region for several years. It returned to Beirut and in 1982, when Israel invaded, uh, the building where the collection was kept was uh, bombed and the collection vanished. So what the two researchers and curators have done in their project is not to trace the artworks, but the networks that made this unique collection based on solidarity possible. And at, they've done bigger exhibitions with this material, one at Haus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin, another one at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona, MACBA. At Tensta Konstal, it was a smaller archival exhibition that particularly looked at a Swedish version of a solidarity uh, action, not in relation to this collection, but to uh, a collection in Santiago de Chile that was started at the time of uh, Allende's uh, socialist government in the early 70s. So connected to that, we also did a number of seminars uh, a particular kind of uh, seminar called witness seminar. And I would just like to say a few words about it because it's such a, an interesting format. Um, it was developed in the 50s by uh, historians in uh, Britain who wanted to research uh, workers' history, but they often came across the argument that it's almost impossible because there are no documents. There is so little material to start from. What a witness seminar is doing is that it is producing such material. So you bring together a group of people who are witnesses, so to speak, who tell about a particular event or phenomenon. Uh, there is a moderator. Um, there is a discussion after the witness reports have been given. It's recorded and eventually um, edited and published. And then you have something that is researchable. You have material to start from. So we did one of those seminars, witness seminars on this solidarity collection with artists from Sweden donating to this other solidarity museum in Santiago de Chile. So Tensta Konstal. It was founded in 1998 uh, by an artist who lived and worked in the area. And he gathered friends and they lobbied the city of Stockholm. The municipality found the idea relevant and uh, decided to support it. It quickly became a private foundation, which since the beginning has been supported by the municipality. And also soon uh, applied for and got support from the state and also from the region. The actual space is former storage, about 400 square meters underneath um, this shopping mall, which is uh, more or less next door to the subway station. From above, the area looks like this on the right-hand side. It's a late modernist uh, suburb built between 1967 and 1972. 
um, as part of a nationwide program to improve housing in Sweden. Uh, so it is not only prefabricated housing, it's not only Khrushchevki in that sense, different kinds of construction systems were used. Uh, it's actually, architecturally speaking, very varied. Today, 20,000 people live in Tensta, 90% of whom have a translocal background, many from the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, statistically speaking, it's a place where people have a lower income than the national average. The unemployment is higher than the national average. Uh, the average age is lower than the national average. Uh, for many people in Sweden, this is known as a ghetto, which is the wrong term. And uh, it also gives uh, problematic um, uh, connotations in, in relation to a very run down area. It's not really the case. Um, it is located next to um, a natural reserve, which you can see on the left. So you have this proximity to uh, nature, which is actually former farmland. And on the right hand side, you can see one of the cottages that uh, is remaining. Uh, in the middle of the neighborhood from the farming period. There is also a church, which happens to be the oldest building in the region of Stockholm, uh, with parts from the early 12th century. So it is older than the old town. Basically, no one knows this. So for me, it was immediately very interesting to think about this uh, legacy of the place where even the Vikings left traces in the form of uh, a rune stone, as you can see here. So I came to the Konsthal in 2011. Uh, it had had a tough time and I was uh, asked to revive it and it was clear that it had to be let's say renovated. It needed a lot of uh, care and new strength. Um, and one of the first initiatives was uh, to start a cafe, asking a local organization and eventually a local uh, family, a family living in Tensta to run the cafe because the art center itself uh, is way too small to take such a responsibility. Um, the longest period, it was run by this uh, family with uh, a background in Eritrea and Ethiopia. So the kitchen uh, became popular. It's delicious actually. And, uh, one of the team members suggested that we should do vegan brunches once a month on Sundays uh, because that's what is uh, typical of, uh, of the kitchen from Eritrea and Ethiopia. And also it's hard in Stockholm to find decent vegan food and that became actually uh, a small success. So another thing when I came to Tensta Konstal was to build a team. Um, coincidentally, the people who had worked there before left, so I could start uh, hiring people and the size of the team during my tenure ranged from three and a half to 10, 11 at the most. So this is a small institution and uh, none of us at the beginning at least, lived in Tensta. And we were very well aware of that. We needed to learn more about the neighborhood, about the people living and working there. So a cheap uh, trick, you could say, a simple way of uh, actually collectively doing so was what we called um, dislocated staff meetings. So once a month, we would do our weekly staff meeting in a different place 
uh, in the neighborhood, at a local school, at um, the local city administration, um, in the space of a local association, etc. And we would have our own meeting, which was important. It was not just a study visit. It was not only to look at what other people were doing. We needed to take care of our own business, but it also gave us the opportunity to learn about the activities of our hosts. And we could importantly invite them back to the Konsthal. And at a, an event like the one you see on this image, this became uh, apparent that meeting people through the dislocated uh, staff meetings uh, helped us uh, get in touch and learn about what was going on. What you see here is a snapshot from the so-called uh, local lunches. So when it was time for an opening of an exhibition, we did not do VIP openings. Instead, we did a local lunch the day of the opening, inviting people we had worked with or gotten to know in the neighborhood to meet the artists uh, and to be the first ones to see the show. And then in the evening, there would be an opening which was open for everyone. As I mentioned, the history of the neighborhood became a focal point. Throughout the eight years that I was at Tensta Konsthal, mostly crystallized through a multi-year project. So similarly to the Eros effect that I mentioned, Tensta Museum reports from New Sweden went on for uh, several years, six to be precise. So with Tensta Museum, we pretended to be a museum. We played museum, you could say, because a museum has authority to speak about history. We invited a number of artists, architects, researchers, local associations, musicians, and even a philosopher, Boris Boden, who is originally from Zagreb, currently based in Berlin, to work with us looking at history and memory in Tensta, the location, the physical place, as well as the people living and working there. We began with uh, a big symposium, that's the image you can see here, uh, curated by Boris Boden, where we discussed the notion of cultural heritage and uh, the shift from history writing to cultural heritage from the 70s onwards. And Boris became our project philosopher, almost like a Sputnik, a, a traveling companion that joined us throughout these years uh, at different points. And the artists and the others were invited to do projects for the first exhibition because it was meant to be a group exhibition. And this is a sh an installation shot of the first part of the Tensta Museum group exhibition an eclectic exhibition, mixing old artworks, new artworks, archival material, amateur, uh, amateur artworks, you could say, or um, manifestations. Um, and it uh, went on for three months. We called it the full department. A museum has departments, right? So we called the first part the full department, which was then later turning into the spring department where some of the works remained, others were removed and new ones were added for the spring department. And pay attention to the yellow and black sign in the middle, the silent university, Ahmed Urgut's project, which I will speak about in a moment. The same 
full department from another angle. In the foreground, you see a video work by uh, Copenhagen-based artist Pia Rönnike. This is an example of one of the strands that went through Tensta Museum, namely artists looking at late modernist housing in different parts of the world. Because not only does late modernist housing exist in most part, parts of the world, there are also artists everywhere, more or less, being interested in this particular phenomenon, this type of housing. And what they share is that they actually often relate to late modernist housing in a more complex way than mainstream media, for instance, which has a tendency to simplify and to talk about these areas as uh, ugly, bad, monotonous, etc. The artists uh, provide typically a more complex and I would say interesting reading. There was an archival part to, to uh, the fall department looking at the building history of Tensta itself based on the private collection of uh, an architect who used to live in the area and who is a specialist on late modernist housing in Sweden. He also organized, and this went on for several years, regular walking tours in the neighborhood, looking at the architecture history and the planning history of the area. The local historical society or the local heritage, heritage association kindly let us use some of their photographs. And it was also their idea to display them on this kind of old uh, poster stand that you might remember from museums back in the day if you wanted to buy a poster. And another example of an artist uh, who actually in his work has uh, returned again and again to late modernist housing, Victor Rostal. Elinebari is an area in uh, the south of Sweden, which was designed by Jörn Utson, the architect who is mostly known for the Sydney Opera. So here we also have uh, an example of how this type of areas sometimes were designed by very famous uh, architects. In uh, the artist's future vision, it was shown in 2013, um, but the vision is from 2020. So from that perspective, a future dystopian view of a situation where nature is about to take over. Uh, Terence Gower looking at the famous uh, late modernist area in Mexico City, Tlatelolcona, where there was also an infamous uh, infamous massacre of students in the, the late 60s. As I mentioned, non-art material, uh, Amin Amir. He is a uh, cartoonist making political cartoons about uh, Somalia. He's in exile in Canada, but um, at the very beginning, when I came to Tensta Kvonstal, a man came up to me and uh, gave me a note handwritten and said, it would be great if you one day did something with this. I looked at it a few days later and it was Amin Amir's um, political drawings, which I thought mm, this is not so relevant for us. But in the context of Tansta Museum, it became very interesting because one of the largest groups in Tansta is actually a group with uh, a background in Somalia. So together with the Somali Association, we did uh, several uh, events around Amin Amir's uh, drawings. We also borrowed old artworks from the local school. Uh, there is a tradition in Sweden since the early 20th century that schools have original works of art. They often belong to municipal collections. And 
this goes for the four works that you can see in this picture. And this one, which is second from the left, is um, a drawing by Carl Larson. And Carl Larson is possibly the most well-known artist of all times. So just to realizing that there is a local school in this neighborhood, which has an artwork by this influential and well-known artist, and that we could borrow it and highlight the fact that 365 days per year, this is the kind of art that actually exists in a neighborhood which is typically seen as more of a ghetto than an, a place for art. A museum should have branches, right? So we approached two museums in the city center, the Stockholm City Museum and the Museum of Medieval Stockholm and asked if we could do branches with them. And they actually agreed as long as we paid for everything. So uh, Katharina Lundgren, she did uh, a new work relating to landscaping in the outskirts of Stockholm, hills constructed of uh, rubble from buildings that were torn down in the city center in the 50s and 60s. But it was very um, interesting to create this back and forth movement because Stockholm is a segregated city with a city center that is white and wealthy, if I simplify, and a ring of suburbs that are colored and poor. Again, a simplification. And uh, the traffic between the two is not always uh, very intense. So to have a branch of this suburban museum, which was not a museum, but a project where we played museum in these prestigious museums in the city center uh, was something that we uh, felt was right in, at that point in time. And when we were doing this, um, all of a sudden the local library contacted us saying, we're going to have a renovation. We need to have a place for some of our books, can we open a branch at uh, the Konsthall? So for several months, we had a branch of the local library in the Konsthall at the same time as Tensta Museum had branches in the city center with the museums I mentioned. And the black and yellow sign, the silent university. Ahmed Ögut is an artist who is uh, currently living in Berlin, but he's, um, from Diyarbakir, he's from the Turkish part of Kurdistan, um, spent a lot of time in uh, Istanbul. And he proposed when we invited him to Tansta Museum to do the silent university. He had developed it a couple of years earlier with Tate Modern in London as a platform to facilitate for people not having the right legal papers to practice their knowledge, to share their competence. And uh, when we invited him to do the silent university in Tansta, he talked to the lady with the hijab, Fahima Al-Nabsi, who was working as, and still is working as the receptionist. And she proposed that if the silent university is going to happen in that very con context, it could be a language cafe. Uh, she herself is a trained teacher who came to Tansta from Damascus in the early 90s. She could never get a job as a teacher in Sweden. But uh, in this case, she became the leader of uh, the language cafe, finding volunteers who are native Swedish speakers who uh, started to meet once a week to practice Swedish with people who are interested in doing so. Very quickly, they asked for more than once a week. So in the end, there was this language cafe happening in the Konsthall, often in the middle of an exhibition, as you can see here. Uh, Swedish was being practiced. And once a month, there was uh, an excursion to a different part of the city to use a different vocabulary. 
but also to get to know other parts of the city, uh, museums, uh, libraries, parks, etc. In this case, uh, the excursion was to the parliament, a guided tour of uh, the parliament. So this is the plenary, one of the plenary rooms of the parliament. So all of this happened uh, as part of the group exhibition Tensta Museum. It was intensive, it was eclectic, uh, and towards the end, we were approached by the local branch of Swedish for Migrants. It's a state school for newly arrived people who have the right papers to learn Swedish. They said, we would like to use the art center for our classes in the summer, could we do so? We think that our students will learn much better if they are in a different environment. Uh, we said yes and quickly bought new furniture, the cheapest possible at IKEA. And in this way, our first classroom was uh, founded um, and they, the Swedish for Migrants used it that summer. And ever since uh, they have returned every summer with their classes. And ever since we also decided to uh, do um, a classroom where different kinds of activities can take place, including something like this, uh, a course for young people who want to tell other stories about the Stockholm suburbs than the ones that dominate in the media, which are mostly very negative, and uh, using journalism, but also artistic methods to tell those stories. Once the group exhibition Tensta Museum was over, both the fall department and the spring department, we realized that we could not just stop uh, Tensta Museum. It was too rich. So it morphed into Tensta Museum Continues. And uh, this work by Ingela Irman, um, a sculpture made out of papier mache and other super simple materials like uh, brown tape, uh, like old tarpaulin, etc., relates uh, to the natural reserve that you remember from the aerial view next to Tensta. It's a giant hogweed, the kind of invasive plant that is the enemy of every gardener because it's impossible to stop and which uh, is also poisonous. If you get some of its juice on your skin, you can get rashes. I think it's called Bolshevik in uh, Russian. And uh, it is prevalent in this natural reserve next to Tensta. And for Ingela Irman, there is an added um, meaning also because it's giant. Uh, she has an interest in things that go beyond what's, what is considered normal, not least bodily speaking. So something that is uh, too big to be uh, thought of as uh, beautiful or valuable. But at the same time, we also did straightforward exhibitions that were not part of uh, any ongoing series that were not uh, directly connected to the neighborhood. For instance, a solo show with Iman Issa, who is from Cairo, living in Berlin right now, and uh, an exhibition looking at the function of memory uh, in relation to national history. Or Leonor Antunes, the artist who is originally from uh, Lisbon, moving between Berlin and Lisbon, who often draws on architecture and design history, particularly female architects and designers, and uh, taking some of the characteristics of their work into her own sculptural installations. In this case, Greta Grossman, who is uh, one of the mothers of uh, the Californian villa, as we think of it, but 
she started her professional life as a designer in Stockholm in the 30s. And for Leonora Antunes, uh, craft is very important. So craft was something that uh, we played on in her installation in relation to uh, some local activities. We also did historical projects, um, unexpected for some people. Doing what you want, Marie-Louise Ekman accompanied by sister Corita Kent, Mladen Stilinovic and Martha Wilson. Uh, if you stop a person in Sweden in the street and ask them to name uh, an artist who is alive today, they're quite likely to say Marie-Louise Ekman. She started working in the late 60s. Uh, drawing on popular culture from the point of view of a young woman. Uh, this is a classic piece by her uh, in the collection of the Modern Museum in Stockholm. Influences from children's books as well as comic and uh, with an interest in uh, transformation, metamorphosis, and uh, cross-dressing. And this uh, also features in her 12 or something feature films, because from the mid 70s onwards, she also became a film director. And eventually also a theater uh, playwright and uh, the director of the Royal Dramatic Theatre in Stockholm. And the retrospective of her work that we did at Tenta Konstal came as a surprise to people. They thought she should uh, rather uh, work on um, a bigger institution in Sweden, but she was interested in the context of, of Tenta. And uh, we organized a uh, uh, a special guided tour of her show for the uh, local women's association. And they find, found it so interesting that they in turn invited her to do a talk in their um, space, which then led to her inviting them to their studio. So there was um, this ongoing exchange which also, whoops, let's see, led to this, that she uh, made a silk screen a print uh, to benefit the women's center. She, um, she uh, asked us to produce it and sell it and the profit went to uh, the women's center. There was also um, a book that we made uh, the first one in English with specially uh, commissioned uh, texts about her work by international scholars on feminism and pop art. As an example that of the fact that uh, the art center could work very much in relation to the situation in the neighborhood but it could also, to some little degree, contribute to uh, scholarship. And this Women's Center, a multi-ethnic uh, association, which, uh, was, which is there as a kind of extended living room for many women who are not usually leaving their home so often, they're doing language classes there, uh, cooking classes, or just hanging out together. We um, asked them during our dislocated staff meeting there what they would like to do, what would be interesting for them in relation to the art center. And they quickly replied that they would like to make a tea and coffee salon to discuss and perform to show how to make tea and coffee in uh, different regions, primarily in the Middle East. And it was actually through this first tea and coffee salon with the Women's Center that we got in touch with Fahima Al-Nabsi, who is, as I mentioned, leading the 
language cafe of Ahmed Ergut's art project, the Silent University. She was hired as a receptionist and um, she is since then a key person uh, of the team at the art center. So I'm going to uh, quickly run through a few uh, projects here uh, in order to have time also to talk about um, some other curatorial projects. So as you have understood from what we have here, uh, we worked with artists who might be very well known internationally um, but in ways that we felt could make sense uh, in the context of this specific construct. So we could speak about embeddedness in the sense that uh, many of the activities had connections to other activities, to people in the neighborhood. And uh, this was also true working with um, artists whose practice might be considered uh, quite um, difficult, as it were. Um, and there was also a wish to experiment with the um, curatorial formats. And we did so with the notion of a retrospective. Uh, Goldin and Senneby, a Stockholm-based duo, working a lot with uh, late uh, capitalist finance economy, uh, offshore finance specifically, and uh, performativity and magic, quite inspired by Georges Bataille. We did a retrospective with them entitled Standard Length of a Miracle, where at the art center itself, there was not um, old works as in a retrospective, but actually a commission, a new work with this uh, giant tree uh, referring to the oak tree in the Marly forest in Paris, where Georges Bataille met with his, uh, his uh, acephal friends, headless friends in the 30s. And uh, there were a number of formative elements connected to uh, this new work with a short story written by a well-known uh, Swedish writer. And it was read every day at a certain time by the team of the Konsthal uh, under the tree. And parts of the tree were made into uh, furniture and uh, connecting to the short story about a man working at um, a dry cleaners dreaming about working in an art center. The other part of the new work was uh, a new fashion line with the remade clothes that had been forgotten or left at dry cleaners in Stockholm. And the team was wearing uh, these uh, items during the exhibition. But the retrospective, the old works, they were not shown at the art center, but in a number of different settings in the city of Stockholm in settings where we thought that uh, there would be a particular resonance in relation to the work in question. So this new fashion line was shown in a fashion store, uh, a work dealing with um, uh, the euro dollar, uh, the Soviet invention from the 50s, uh, where a currency was uh, dislocated from uh, a nation, was shown at uh, the state finance inspection in their lobby downstairs. Uh, they have written a novel uh, through a ghostwriter, Headless, which uh, was also part of the project. Uh, yet another part, the bancarotta, the broken bench, the money traders bench, which was what uh, bankruptcy actually meant at the uh, early times of um, economy as we know it today. So if 
the money uh, broker went bankrupt. His bench was uh, broken. It was a bancarota. It's in the library of the Stockholm School of Economics. Another project at the third state pension fund. And a show with a real magician um, as part of uh, the retrospective. So here I would like just to give you uh, some final words about um, the dynamics. You have probably gathered that things uh, developed rather organically um, with art um, at the center of the stage, art as the heart and soul of the activities, with the art being close to other activities. Here is, for instance, uh, the Art Porch, uh, a group of women who met and still meet uh, regularly to do ha handicraft together. So next to the retrospective of Godin and Senebi, for instance, there would be activities like this one. Uh, and for me, this was uh, a fascinating challenge, how to work with what I consider the most interesting, the most uh, urgent art of our time from Sweden, from other parts of the world, in a place like Tensta Konstal, to try and make sense of it in that very context, at the same time as other things are going on, which are maybe more akin to uh, a community center, let's say, but which more or less always started with the uh, art uh, projects in one way or another. Then they might develop having their own life, but there would almost always be this um, connection from the beginning. Yeah, as an example of uh, also activity activities connected to children, you know, this is a staple with the art institutions today. We also did different kinds of courses and art camps uh, for kids, uh, actually always in collaboration with art educations so that art educations would lend us their teachers who would then get to know kids in the area, uh, which in turn would mean that hopefully the kids would uh, get to know uh, other educations, possible trajectories uh, for the future, because it's uh, a big problem that those who go to art schools in Sweden uh, tend to be uh, from the middle and upper classes. One of those art camps with an architect where the kids learned how to make tree huts in the natural reserve. Frederick Kiesler, a classic in terms of exhibition history. He more or less revolutionized uh, exhibition design uh, from the 20s uh, until uh, he passed away in the mid 60s. So we did a retrospective with Frederick Kiesler, Visions at Work, uh, annotated by Celine Condorelli and six student groups. So we had work by Frederick uh, Kiesler we invited uh, the artist Celine Condorelli to comment on Kiesler's work and to develop something using that as a starting point. And we worked with six student groups who started to learn about Kiesler half a year before the show came up. And they each developed something that made sense to them in relation to Kiesler. And we eventually presented uh, ah, here is his uh, gorgeous uh, surrealist gallery at the Peggy Guggenheim's Art of This Century that opened in 1942, where he displayed surrealist works uh, in a specially made room with bent wooden walls. He removed all the frames because he thought that they prevented the viewer from having a 
uh, an optimal relationship to the work. Atta and he attached the canvases to these wooden arms, uh, which made it possible to change the angle of the works um, to optimize the encounter between the viewer and the work. I will show some drawings uh, preparing uh, that he used to prepare this uh, spectacular gallery. Uh, some other uh, features, his furniture and his um, only built, large scale built structure, the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem. And a model of the Endless House, which you find in more or less every handbook of um, 20th century architecture. It was never realized. And Celine Condorelli's uh, edition. And you can see on the left, uh, a reconstruction of his circular stage, which he designed for the first time in the 20s in Vienna. And this was the place where the language cafe had their gatherings uh, twice a week. So here you have this idea of the proximity principle that art sits very close to something uh, else and these activities are parallel. So there is a sense of uh, de-dramatization of art in the context. All the groups that came to the Konstal and towards the end of my time, we had at least one group every day who came to use the Konstal space for their activities, for their meetings, etc. Uh, we would always offer a brief introduction of the current project, but trying to avoid throwing art at people. So offering it, uh, let's say, gently um, and actually, I think it um, it did work pretty well uh, in the sense that uh, people, particularly those who came back as frequent visitors, um, expressed a sense of, of uh, curiosity of something that they didn't think they were curious about. Yeah, here you can see the language cafe uh, in action. Yes, there are a few more examples of uh, shows, just um, a research-based project by the eminent Marion von Osten, artist and uh, curator who sadly passed away prematurely uh, a year and a half ago, looking at Peter Weiss, the German writer who ended up in Sweden. Uh, he came as a refugee uh, during the Second World War and became one of the most influential post-war writers in Germany and a project, uh, the Vietnam discourse he did with, uh, with uh, uh, Gunil Lapan Khanavais, uh, a stage designer who is mostly known for having worked a lot with Ingmar Bergman. So a research-based project, looking at the history of Vietnam uh, in the middle of the burning Vietnam war, but not wanting to talk about Vietnam as only the victim, but actually a place with a fascinating history. So let me, well, maybe it's actually worth uh, mentioning here just that with, the, uh, with the, the Vietnam discourse by Marion von Osten, this was also part of uh, the Eros effect, art solidarity and the quest for social justice. And it was unfolded into a series of uh, film screenings, looking at uh, how Swedish state television commissioned and broadcast documentary films in relation to Vietnam. Uh, the Dance University of Stockholm decided to do a course around uh, the play, the Vietnam uh, discourse, which was the title of the play that Peter Weiss uh, wrote, which had never been performed in Sweden before, only in Germany. So this uh, University of Dance uh, decided to do a course at the Konsthal, taking this play 
as a starting point. And this is something that we develop more and more towards the end of my time in Tensta, namely to integrate exhibitions, art projects into uh, teaching, primarily uh, university level teaching. So the Stockholm School of Economics did a number of seminars in the Golden and Senebi show. In this case, the University of Dance. We also did it with the art history department, uh, etc. So how to think about art as a resource, keeping the respect um, for art and artists, not utilizing it in, let's say, the wrong way, and at the same time to um, pull out things that uh, can be meaningful in particular educational settings. So this is my final example, and then I will wrap up. Perhaps the most simple and most expected project, but, some, but one which is dear to me, art and shops. Uh, when the Constal turned 20 in uh, 2018, we thought that we should move beyond our walls even more than before. We had constantly done uh, smaller projects here and there in collaboration with schools, uh, with other agents in the neighborhood. But with art and shops, it became more visible uh, in a broader sense. So starting in the cafe of the Konsthal, we showed existing artworks in uh, cafes and shops. You remember that the art center is underneath a shopping mall. So the painting on the wall here by Thomas Elofsson uses a pattern, a flooring pattern on the ground in the city center, in not the city, but in the in the center of Tensta. And in the shopping mall itself, for a whole for six months, works were shown in shops. So here the same artist with the same pattern in the flower shop, in the phone uh, repair shop. Uh, in the pizzeria, which is run by a man uh, original, originally from Turkey, two videos by Annika Eriksson looking at gentrification of Istanbul through the life of cats on the one hand and on the life of dogs on the other. So two different videos on flat screens um, embedded into the bar uh, situation. Salad Hilovle, another video, uh, letters from Sweden in the household store. Dale Harding, some people might remember him as uh, the artist from Brisbane in Documenta in 2017, who uses the oldest existing painting technique in the world, which his ancestors, um, the Aboriginal peoples of uh, Queensland use, namely you put uh, pigment in your mouth and then you blow. So it becomes a stencil uh, on the wall using objects. Here he collaborated with the hairdresser and it's the hands of the worker in the hairdresser, uh, as well as the tools of the hairdresser. For me, it was, wonderful that an artist who uh, featured in uh, Documenta, which is of course uh, such, a, such an important exhibition, when he did a residency at Jaspis in Stockholm, the International Artist Studio Program in Sweden, he uh, agreed to do something like this and it's actually still there um, four years later. Pinar Ögrenci, you will see her work in the upcoming Documenta, um, another video. And my last shot for this 20th anniversary in 2018, we also continued on this idea of doing an inventory of 
what kind of art is there in Tensta? And the local schools, there is a handful of schools there from uh, first grade until senior high school. And we found out that putting it all together, we could make an exhibition with Swedish art history from the 20th century, only with works that are in Tensta 365 days uh, per year. So we borrowed 30 of them, installed them in our classroom. We always had such a classroom. Uh, this one uh, designed by uh, Christian Jampeta. So we invited all the school classes during this uh, anniversary year when we had a one year show with those 30 borrowed artworks from the schools to talk about uh, this particular tradition of having art at schools in Sweden. We also invited uh, their teachers uh, with uh, seminars on how they could potentially think about using some of this art in their teaching. What happened during my tenure at Tensta Konstal would is was only possible thanks to the team. It was an amazing, small, very dedicated team. And another crucial part was the networks that we were part of. So uh, this is something that I think is really crucial when we talk about curating in the 20 teens, namely that people got together, uh, forming networks, supporting each other, a kind of solidarity networks, you could say. And Tansta Konstal uh, co-initiated several of them in Stockholm, in Sweden, in Europe and beyond. And there are also many more that Tensta was not involved with. Uh, and some of them don't exist anymore, but some of them still continue, like the L'Internazionale in the middle of the list. I've also listed here at the bottom a couple of uh, texts that might be interesting for you when it comes to the functioning of small scale arts institutions, primarily in, in the Western European context, and the challenges that come from, from running them, but also the, the rewards uh, in terms of what it means to work often in a situated way in a particular neighborhood. So I think I will stop sharing and I'm looking forward to hear Victor now. Your mic, we cannot hear you. Uh, no. And now? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Maria. It was extremely, extremely interesting to listen to, to your experience in Konshal because I've heard from, from our common friends, uh, from some artists who took part in your, in your experience, in your long years experience. I, I have I've had a talk with uh, Boris Buden once about about his um, involvement in in as a Sputnik um, of your of of your project in Kotzhal. Uh, so now I got I got I got an idea from 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 the right source from the from the main source of uh, uh, from you. Well, I don't know. How Katie Chukrov uh, um, intervened in your previous presentation. In any case, as I told you yesterday, no counter speech. Uh, op opposite, I have a series of questions, remarks, of, uh, thoughts, which I want to share with you in a form of questions. Uh, well, is that Katie is a theoretician and I'm a first of all curator. So my 
my, my reflections are mostly focused on your curatorial experience. And uh, obviously, formulating my, my questions, I was in some way, inevitably, I was comparing your experience with mine. I have to tell to, to, to say that uh, formally, even not formally, but but I mean this is this is a reality. We belong to the same age haters. If I suppose we have a different age, but as a curators, we mostly belong to curators who established their position in the nineties, in the course of the nineties. And uh, uh, I have to say that we have a lot, a lot of common, much you expect. Uh, uh, but there is one basic difference. Well, there are many different, uh, I guess. But uh, the first one which came me into my mind when I was reading, uh, reading about constant uh, experience and. Uh, there and in general, knowing your professional parkour, the difference is your relation institutions. Uh, most of your professional uh, career happened inside the institutions. In my case, it's not like that. I have to say that I failed. <laughs> I failed in my attempts to be an. Uh, I started my career as a Pushkin Museum curator. I have to say that this museum in years ago, um, when it, that was a different institution, totally different institution from nowadays. This institution gave me at the settlement, I took a decision and I still think that it was a rightful decision, I guess. I left Pushkin Museum and became independent curator. Later, I've done some other attempts to, to become the institutional curator or to, to have a permanent job inside the certain uh, public structures. But I failed that I was, uh, that I was, uh, um, unable um, to to go to negotiations when it was needed, that, that I was egoistically with my projects, and uh, I thought, I presumed that uh, bureaucracy, uh, administration, it is uh, should satisfy my my demands without questions, uh, without objections. Yes, it was done a lot of mistakes from my side, <laughs> but in any case, my uh, professional uh, um, uh, destiny um, uh, took a form of absolutely independent curator. It is perhaps a very childish, egoistically childish position as a, as a star, as a vedette, uh, full of caprices, I'm coming to an institution with my my demands, and after that, I'm leaving. Um, I'm leaving, and the institution has absolutely another uh, continues their own life, uh, absolutely uh, on their own way, and I'm continuing my my life in my own way. One institution to another. Your model is completely different. I think, as I told before. Uh, of the same generation, and we curators from the 90s are marked as being very innovative, um, very socially, socially provocative. Um, because I think, uh, I think what came with, I think, in fact, after 70s, when curatorship was established. By, by hands like uh, like Harald Zeman, like Sedzigelau, like Pontus Kulten, your compatriot, like um, a few others. Uh, Lucy Lippard. Uh, um, uh, extremely innovative 
Ja, Lucy Liebert, of course. Said the yellow Lucy Lippert, yeah, this, this um, dialogical couple who contributed a lot in uh, in innovating approach to an exhibition making. Yeah, I think that our generation was was the second the second wave of non conformist um, uh, curatorship in the history of uh, of of curatorship in general. But you succeeded live inside institutions being without from external point of view i would say compromises you entering the institution i know i i attended once your talk about your munich experience uh and it was extremely innovative and absolutely um absolutely unconventional first of all for such a such a console in, in many. So how you succeeded? <laughs> how <laughs> how I, I presume it was not, I presume it was not so easy. And I presumed your the bureaucracy and the thing with whom you had to do to work with uh, were more elastic more correct than some um, some uh, subjects with whom i was working in uh, in uh, in uh, Soviet and uh, post soviet times yeah mm. but still still these are these people with completely for on some people with with different uh, uh, points of view on, on, on many, many things. This, this people who are mostly emphasizing routine mm. and repetition of conventional norms, uh, what you never done, what you never wanted to do, and what you never done. And even now, you are uh, working even not in a cultural but you are very actively <laughs> um, uh, uh, practicing inside um, uh, foreign ministry, <laughs> foreign ministry structure. So um, <laughs> satisfy my curiosity. Yes. Tell us about. And I think it's something what what, what had to know had to know how an innovative curator uh, should act in such a circumstance. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's an interesting and, and important um, question. I have often been given jobs uh, in situations where there has been a wish for change. When there was a feeling that we need to take a turn in what we're doing or we have to restructure our institution so there has been a readiness for something else something beyond the routine not that all the directors or the boards have loved everything i did i had to struggle quite a bit um, but i can say that i have not compromised a lot or maybe not at all when it comes to content let's say the artists i have wanted to work with but as important as the selection process, which is what tends to be privileged in curating, is how you work with not only artists, but how you also work with an entire institution. So what is the, what is the policy? What are the methods? What is the ethics, uh, let's say? And I'm not saying that I've done everything right, but I've paid, I think, uh, a lot of attention to also the mechanisms and how it is possible to change those mechanisms so that they serve art and artists better. And um, I was lucky because there was this readiness uh, to do it, but uh, it also became too much. Sometimes. So, for instance, um, as I talked to Katie about last time, uh, 
I left Moderna Museet in Stockholm after four years to move to Munich because um, the Modern Museum in Stockholm is the big central museum for modern and contemporary art in Sweden. And um, I felt that it was too inflexible. It was too much of a conveyor belt principle. And for me, it was essential to try and dance with the artists or shadow the artists so that we would adjust how we worked in relation to what the artists were doing. And it was possible, but it was quite exhausting. And um, after four years, I said goodbye and I got the job um, in Munich after I had resigned from the Modern Museum. And in Munich, they explicitly wanted uh, something different. They didn't say that they wanted something experimental, but the curatorial team and I, Søren Grammel, Anna Paula Cohen, uh, Julien Lortz, Judith Schwarz, but Katrina Schlieben, uh, together we actually made it into something rather experimental. And uh, you need some negotiation skills, yes, but you also need to be a bit stubborn, to insist, but you also have to argue well why it is important to do things the way you think are the most appropriate. I um, uh, And I think it's also possible, it was possible because I always got a lot of energy from, from uh, looking at art and talking to artists. So this um, conviction that we have to be more sensitive to the sensibilities of art and the, the modus operandi that art is asking for. And this changes with art, of course, because art is uh, evolving. And another aspect that I would like to mention is that I have a strong sense that uh, public institutions belong to us. So we should also have the right to affect them. They should not uh, rule us. We should also rule them in that sense. And institutions, that's the second, the next step in the, in the logic then institutions are important because if we talk to sir john searle and others um, institutions are uh, apparatuses for change and if i should try to boil down my own uh, approach to things over the years you know in at the kunstverein in munich at the modern museum in stockholm uh, at Tensta Konsthall in Tensta in, in, a, in the suburb of Stockholm, it's actually uh, not to accept status quo. So, was that an answer? Yeah, 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 that is a very beautiful answer. And I'm totally so uh, today uh, I was uh, uh, yeah because I was asked by by Moscow Museum magazine to to, uh, to 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 ask if I by chance I have some uh, text related to this catastrophe because um, uh, um, uh, um, they consider it's a very up-to-date topic, yeah. And discovered, I immediately recalled that I have a text done in the 90s, in fact, uh, um, uh, um, glossary text, catastrophe, which by the way was published by G Germano Celland in uh, 1997 in his catalog of Venice Biennial. And in fact, I was reading it today, and uh, very much in the spirit of 90s, I was 
go toward institutions. And in fact, I was reflecting uh, that in the reality, you're and in fact, you're absolutely right. It's not our enemy a priori. Institutions could be our toys. It could be our instrument. Substance, they, they could have a plastic substance. We can model it, how, uh, how um, uh, we... This is, uh, the, in that I'm totally agree with you nowadays. I'm totally agree, agree with you, even if my, my experience with institutions was perhaps uh, was, was, was not so positive. But still, uh, there is another moment which could be, uh, should be, from my point of view, taken into consideration. That sometimes, and in fact, it's what I felt. It, it, what, it, was, it was what I witnessed in my personal uh, curatorial becoming. I've had a period when I was working in an institution, in, it was called Contemporary Art Center. Uh, it was um, a center based on fundraising. Uh, how to fundraise in the 90s in Russia, in, even in Moscow. You can imagine that uh, it moment of profound, uh, profound crisis. And uh, I was supported by a small group of, of young who gave me uh, very modest, but still a support to run these institutions, which I was uh, doing in the course of three, four years, I guess, yeah, 1993 till 1997. Uh, and it, exactly because it was a very poor institution, because there were no pressure uh, from, uh, from board trustees, from uh, bureaucracy. It was totally independent institution. It, in reality, it was a joy. Um, uh, experimented a lot uh, in these institutions. I transformed this institution uh, in laboratory. And uh, a lot of my point of view, interesting, uh, interesting experiments, which I used in the course of my posteriori uh, experience. But what I witnessed that time is that against experimentation, breaking with a conventional routine, uh, institutional routine and conventional forms of bureaucrats, but there are also artists or art, art sphere, uh, because also the moral majority of art sphere, art sphere uh, they also or classical model of institutional um, uh, reproduction. They want glamour exhibitions. They want, uh, they consider art as a, as a feast. Uh, art is an autonomous glamour field. Uh, so, oh, and I have to say, I have also to mention that, um, you know, my exhibition project, Interpol, in Stockholm, in fact, yeah. Um, I remember it very well. My, uh, as an exhibition, it was a failed project. Yeah, <laughs> which in fact, as an exhibition became a failed exhibition, but as a project because became a very successful project. In this project, in this exhibition project, I failed uh, in, how to say, consider an exhibition as a process, as a dialogue, as a communication, as a, um, uh, mostly with artists and also with Swedish artists. By the way, very interesting artists, but we're not recognizing themselves in this kind of curatorial uh, 
Uh, so I want to, I want to, I want to, 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 to have now your reaction. Have you met uh, situations like that? Have you been criticized um, uh, by uh, artistic uh, community or some, some, let's say, um, some subjects of uh, of uh, of artistic community for what you were doing? How you oppose it? Uh, it was helping you, it was reconvincing you in your position, or it was also perhaps sometimes productive in the sense you were also asking yourself, are you on the right way or not? How, so how was, how was your becoming, I mean, your curatorial becoming in relation to that scene, uh, rejection and, and potential rejection and criticism? Yeah, yeah, that's... Um... That's a good one. I can say that I've always been very criticized for what I'm doing. That's a, a red thread. Uh, people um, have had different kinds of objections. We spoke a little bit about that uh, at the last webinar also in Munich. There was, I think today, a legitimate critique in relation to how we communicated the very complex program in Munich, because we interwove various strands which had different speeds with one another. So from the outside, it was uh, hard to, to distinguish and hard to read. And I think we didn't do a great job in terms of communicating what we did. I think what we did was really good and important. And we tested things along the way. Um, so it was in that sense experimental, but it is not easy to be transparent, to convey an experiment as it is happening. You often need a little bit of retrospect to be able to do that. But here it was in the making at the same time. Um, in uh, uh, Tensta, for instance, there was a mixed response. Some uh, people in Tensta thought that we were too elitist. Um, I remember one review in Art Forum um, about the Frederick Kiesler show, where the reviewer uh, said that it, it is absolutely meaningless for the citizens of Tensta to have a Frederick Kiesler show. Uh, that made me actually very upset because such a patronizing attitude um, does not belong in our era even, uh, because obviously there are many different ways of um, appreciating, of entering a particular body of work. And with that very one with Kiesler, because we had those six different uh, student groups, two of whom were from Tensta. So we had concrete examples of where it actually was really fruitful for the locals to engage with it. But it also doesn't, it's not the, the, the strongest argument in a way when we speak about Tensta Konsthal and, and the activities during my tenure there, uh, how popular the program itself was with uh, the local inhabitants. Even more important was the fact that many, particularly towards the end, came to the place and felt a certain sense of, of uh, appreciation and perhaps also belonging to the place. Um, a place to hang out, a place to meet people, a place where you can go and see some art, but you don't have to if you don't want to. You can also join some other activity uh, that is going on there. And on that note, uh, I can say that certain parts of the art world, you described it well, you know, glamour, art as a feast, people who are interested in that, they did not appreciate our program very much. Although we worked with artists that they might think of as glamorous, etc. whether it's uh, uh, Philippe Parreno or uh, Dominique Gonzalez Förster or Hito Steyr or somebody like that. Um, but other parts of the art world became quite loyal visitors coming to see 
almost everything we did. And then there were two other groups, um, local inhabitants who came very regularly, but not necessarily for the sake of art, but for all, all the other things. And then people who are interested in culture, who are not professionally involved with art, who tended to come, and this was distinct, they tended to come immediately after we had had a review in a daily newspaper or uh, on TV or on uh, radio. They would even come with a news, uh, with a review cut out of the newspaper. And they were not rarely entering with a skeptical expression in their face. It cannot work having this kind of uh, sophisticated, complex art in uh, a neighborhood like Tensta. It just cannot work. And uh, often we could counter act and actually say that, well, it seems to work pretty well to do what we're doing uh, in this very setting, but maybe not the way you think working well is working well. Uh, yeah, I think it's very important uh, that um, that in your in your talk and now in our conversation, you experience in working in uh, not is not in a central institution because till very recent times. Uh, young uh, curators, uh, young art uh, uh, practitioners who were coming on the art scene um, had a dream work in a garage or in VAC foundation. They were looking for the position in this powerful glimmer uh, institution, ignoring uh, that in reality, in less uh, visible, in, uh, and but more elastic institution, you can do a lot, a lot of things. What what this mammoth uh, 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 unable to 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 realize. I mean, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, this uh, it's closed and <laughs> and gets to practically too. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think that still it's very important. To, to indoctrinate young our young colleagues in looking for their own parcours, for their own um, way of acting. But in but this is mostly clear. I guess we convinced them. But now I think it would be suitable to if it's clear why we like to work in a less uh, visible institutions, but why artists and intellectuals are doing that. Why uh, Boris Budin, who is extremely established international thinker, decided to come into your uh, ghetto, how you define it, <laughs> the, 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 in the neighborhood of your institution. Why um, Coldorelli, Cecil Coldorelli, who is a star, young, well, now not any, anymore um, uh, young star, but established star, why she wanted to, to, to work, uh, that she wanted to work with you is clear, but in such a place, mm -hmm. this is a question, why artists and established intellectuals are fascinated by, by, uh, by the project? I believe it's because Tensta is extremely interesting. It's so diverse. Uh, it's a window to the world and in many ways also a window to the future because the way people have ended up there, the way people live their lives, it is what the world is facing more and more. And artists and philosophers are sensitive people. They sense this, they feel this. And uh, I think almost without an exception, uh, the artists we invited found it extremely interesting, not in an exoticized way, but in because of a genuine 
commitment to a certain kind of uh, emancipatory progressive uh, uh, approach to life, let's say. It can also, for that matter, be contemplative. I, I always uh, underline that art should also be able to be uh, contemplative. So, and I have a tendency to return to, to some of the same artists at the same time as I'm trying to make new research so that I get to know new practices. And I really cherish having these uh, long-term exchanges and conversations with artists. It's actually amazing. So I also have something like that with Boris and with Celine since years before. So then you plug into each other's projects and practices at different points in time. But the specificity of Tensta indeed um, was uh, a plus uh, for, for uh, many of the people that we invited. I see now that we have two questions, Victor. Shall we throw them in? Dave. So the first one, uh, great, is, great. was there an yeah, intention let's, to let's, sell? Yeah, the first one is, was there an intention to sell any artworks from the Tensta Museum project later? No, there was no uh, intention to sell the artworks, but we did sell another artwork, which was visible in the Tensta Museum project and in many other projects too, which is the floor of the Konsthal. It's a plywood floor, which uh, was installed for the first exhibition when I started called Abstract Possible, which looked at contemporary abstraction. And it's a work by Wade Guyton, who is a you know, million dollar selling artist who works with monochrome paintings without using a paintbrush. But the idea of painting and monochromes in, in other conceptual ways. And he has made a series of of floors where the floor is a replica of his studio floor when he was once a poor artist and <clears throat> could not afford a proper renovation. So he covered his studio floor in Manhattan, <coughs> sorry, with the cheapest possible plywood, painted it black and realized it was a monochrome painting. So. I asked him if, um, if um, he could remake it for the abstract possible group show in Tensta. He said yes. And to fundraise for the art center. Um, and as part of that very project, we then <coughs> uh, sold one part of the floor as a monochrome painting. So that was the only case. Then, uh, Victor, one for you. What book were you referring to when you talked about the catastrophe of 1997? It was the Germano Celant Venice catalog. I think. Yes, it was a Germano Celant uh, catalog um, of his Venice Biennial uh, project. But initially, the first version of this text, it was published in, in a magazine, a theoretical magazine, which uh, was produced in the 90s by um, a theoretician um, uh, 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 Nikolai Sheptulin. Unfortunately, he passed away very young a few years ago. And uh, uh, the, the, the name of the magazine was Mesta Picciati. Yeah, so my, the, the first version of this text will be, well, was published there. And after that in English, it was published in, uh, in uh, Germano's uh, catalog of from 1997. Yeah. Thank you. Well, to go back to your previous question, Victor, um, working in smaller places, a little bit off the beaten track, I think is so rewarding. That is for sure where you can achieve more, where you can test more than when you are in the direct limelight. So if, if you're interested in really 
developing curatorial practice beyond status quo, those are the most promising contexts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are some other questions from from the students. So I don't see any now. Not but Katya, if there are some, you will let us know. Uh -huh. Should we have some some time still to to talk? Or, yeah, let's. Or let's uh, if you or have, we have to close, we have ten more minutes. Well, you know. Yeah, I have another question mm, uh, because uh, again, I mean, comparing uh, our professional parcours, I noticed, uh, as it seemed to me, another difference. I have a feeling, knowing your work from from your talk today, from my from the talk about Munich, which I am uh, attended once, from from what I know. Your work, it's much more integral. It's much more coherent. You mentioned now uh, that, uh, that you are or that you are returning to the artists with whom you used to work. Uh, you're extending your, uh, your, 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 your research, but um, uh, obviously returning to the artists with whom you worked, you are, you are inviting them to the new uh, uh, to the new new situation, new projects, new thematical context, but still, uh, so it's it's always different. You're always in becoming, but still, I guess uh, your your position it's much more integral than mine, because uh, my career it's uh, well, if I would historicize myself, I would, if I would one day will write autobi my curatorial autobiography, I will cut it as minimum in four different chapters, uh, which would be very, very different, really, because my, what well, the projects I'm doing now are opposite, opposite extreme to what I was doing in, in the 90s with project like, like, uh, like uh, 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 Interpol, yeah, for example. But I repeat, your work seemed to me much more coherent, much more integral. In this, perhaps I'm wrong, so uh, oppose me, uh, deconstruct my, my hypothesis. But uh, what in reality I want to focus your attention as today you told us about your Konsthal um, uh, um, uh, 10 years work, uh, how you would identify it in the context of, 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 your, of your work, of your professional um, uh, career? What, how, what is different from, from Munich, from, from other places, from what you, you've done in Jaspis? Yeah. Why it's close to your heart, this, this yeah, my, my immediate answer would be that uh, Tensta Konstal stands out because it's the most exciting job I've had. Uh, I really, really loved it. It was challenging, uh, but I truly loved working there. Um, and yet it was time to leave after eight years. Um, I don't want to become what in Swedish is called a concrete ass, meaning somebody uh. never moving. <laughs> so it was time to leave. Um, but what stands out is maybe to that I was able to work with with those extremely extremely interesting um, artists. Um, I could shape the program in terms of whom to invite. The board was very allowing, not interfering at all in, in the programming, as long as I found money for it, with the great help of the team. Um, and to develop ways of working with those artists that made sense in relation to this particular institution and a private foundation in a suburb in this type of space, so to work with this in a situated way and to think about it as 
being an, an embedded uh, art institution and making mediation of art part of the of the game from the beginning so it's not outreach the way we're used to thinking about outreach you know museums they identify oh we need to work with uh, this group of retired uh, uh, men or we we should focus now on um, the Egyptian uh, community or something like that it's not like that it's much more about starting with the art and then thinking about contact surfaces between this very art project this very artistic practice and different individuals and groups particularly in the neighborhood of Tensa. so it starts somewhere else so to be able to combine these things was uh, i think was what is so special about Tensta. and i came to this conclusion that i really need to work in a more embedded manner to be able to work with this kind of sophisticated art but to mediate it in ways that make sense in the very context and i came to this conclusion after bard college you know i was the director of a of a graduate program in curatorial studies at bard college upstate new york wonderful students super smart but they were not so interested in um, how art sits in the world, let's say, or how, with whom, with whom should we communicate about art? There was such a focus on themselves, on the artists, on the projects. But what happens when, a, when an artwork is landing somewhere? That's equally important and interesting, I think. So I felt that this is what I need to do next. And then Tensta appeared and it was actually perfect to do precisely that there. Well, with that, I guess we can close. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I should. It's a very beautiful, uh, beautiful statement, conclusive statement. Yes, there are a couple of questions though. So I should just very quickly answer. Um, Absolutely. How affordable were Tensta tickets for the local community? Was there an entrance fee? There was one when I came, but um, I asked immediately, how much do we earn from this? And it was so small that I could easily argue with the board, let's take it away. We don't have any thresholds in terms of ticket prices and it was for free for the rest of, and it still is free. It would not work otherwise in that, uh, uh context how could one become a member of a language study group you just appeared and we didn't do any advertisement but because of uh, the leader fahima al nablusi's excellent network in stockholm it was word by mouth so people were talking and you remember the big wave of migrants coming through europe across the mediterranean primarily from syria in 2015 and 16. Sometimes it was only three weeks from when they left Syria and they came to Tansta Konstal to attend the uh, language cafe. How did that happen? Well, it's because of, of Fahima's contacts. And uh, the final question, how was Tansta Konstal financed? The funding uh, came from three primary sources, public money, we had to apply more or less every year, the municipality, the state and the region. And that was about half of the budget and the other half was raised through different foundations. Mostly foundations connected to social work and education. So there we had to kind of make some somersaults to fit our projects into their schemes. But funding was always a big challenge and the institution is very brittle, very vulnerable as an institution because there is no continuity in funding. 
there is no guarantee that Tesla Constal will exist in a couple of years time. It is all depending on if the director and the team can uh, find the money. So Victor, what a pleasure to uh, have a conversation with you and to think about our parallel tracks. And of course, you, was one of, you were one of the co-curators of the first Manifesta exhibition in Rotterdam in 1996. Yeah. And I was a proud follower of a member of the team of uh, the 1998 edition in Luxembourg. So yeah. Um, yeah. since then we are on this parallel track. So thank you so much. And thank you also to Sreda Bocenia, to uh, Katya, to Igor, to Nadezhda, and to Maxime, the uh, technical genius behind making all of this happen. And thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.